Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Those of you who can, could you please rise for the prayer? You want to use the mic? Oh. Use the mic. Let's just stay in front. Of you, right? Good evening, Lori. Thank you for bringing all these people together on this hot, sultry night. Please uh, provide your wisdom to guide our deliberations tonight and put us in the right frame in the right heart. Please reach out as we celebrate the independence of our nation to bless our, our nation as we move forward in the future. Bless each individual here and give us the wisdom to make the right choices. We ask your continued blessings in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, hold one while we unfold the flag. Come on, Larry. Come on, Larry. <laughs> okay, if you would all join me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which it stands, one nation, under God, under God invisible, and justice for all. For all. Okay, um, I'd like here we go again. I, I just have a big mouth. I'm from New York, you know. You got a problem with that? Okay, uh, I'd like to recognize uh, school board member Laura Hughes, who's in our audience. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. They are from Protect Our Coast, New Jersey. And they want to speak to us tonight because like us, they are going to be having windmills coming off their coast. And uh, their presenters are Susan Hornick. She's a lifelong Ocean City resident, former social worker, wife, mother of three adult sons, community activist, volunteer, and founder of Ocean City Flooding and co-founder of Protect Our Coast New Jersey. She's very concerned about the coastal environment in Ocean City, as well as the entire East Coast. She's joined in the fight because she truly values the pristine beauty of our coast and all its inhabitants. She worries that the experimental project will irrevocably destroy a significant part of our environment, including birds and marine life. I know it, she says she will, she knows it will destroy her community. Uh, and Butch, Dutch, Tony Butch, sorry, South New Jersey resident, recreational fisherman, Although he has no monetary stake in this project, he loves his, uh, our natural ocean and the sea life within. He wants to protect our natural resources. Fishermen are the original stewards of our coastal waters and he wants to see them flourish. That's why he is joining the fight. And Rick Birch, a year long Ocean City resident with over 60 years of coastal living in Florida, North Carolina, and New Jersey. He is a core committee member of Ocean City Flooding and chairperson of Ocean City Zoning and Planning Review Committee, founding member of Protect Our Coast New Jersey, owner and president of Focus Wealth Advisors LLC, a state registered investment advisor in New Jersey and New North Carolina with over 40 years of, ex of service in the financial service profession. He is a board certified financial planner since 1989. Rick has worked as a financial consultant for the Department of Defense, both in the US and abroad, and has taught high school financial planning, elementary school budget classes, and is very concerned about not just the environment, but also potentially devastating financial burdens on ratepayers, which would be us. A Hall of Fame resume. So I will now turn that over to. Oh, I'm sorry. We also have Virginia Soil and Water Conservation Director Leslie Jones here. Yay! Any other elected officials? I forgot. No. Okay. So now, um, Susan, take it away. Hi, everybody. 
I'm Suzanne Hornick, and uh, let me start by just saying I'm really nervous. I really don't like to do any kind of public speaking. I'm doing this and I'm speaking out in my hometown because this is just a travesty. So just to tell you a little bit about Ocean City, it's similar in that we're a beach community to Virginia Beach. We are a seven and a half mile long island on the southern coast of Barry Island on the coast of southern New Jersey. Um, my, I founded a flooding group here called um, Ocean City Flooding Committee and Virginia Wasserberg in your community has stopped the flooding now and we've worked together on several projects and we belong both to an over arching flooding network. So that's how this all came to be is because Virginia Wasserberg asked that we would come and talk to you because this is coming to you too. And the more we learn about it, the more upsetting it is. I was initially for the wind turbines until I found out what the project was actually going to entail and how unclean and ungreen it actually is. So with that, I will get started. Um, our website is listed there for more information if you want it. Um, everybody's welcome. We also have a face, Facebook page that is linked. Um, this is what we're planning to see in our ocean. Um, this drawing is actually a little bit short, but that wind turbine, it says 722 feet. We now know it's going to be closer. Each blade does 750 feet. And the wind turbines are actually going to be closer to 900 feet tall, which would we could live with if it was going to be one or two. It's not. Keep in mind, I said Ocean City is a small barrier island. We're seven and a half miles long. Our government has leased our waters up and down the East Coast, but they are planning to put four to 800 of these things off the coast of our little teeny island. Now, unlike Virginia Beach, where you have a lot of things because you're a much bigger place that you know helps you survive as a community, we have nothing. Uh, most of the Southern Jersey shore towns have nothing except tourism, with the exception of Cape May, which also has the, our beloved Coast Guard base, but really nothing else. Everything here, our entire economy is based on tourism. We believe, and the studies reflect, that people are not going to want to come here and spend their money and rent places anywhere in the Southern or, or anywhere on the coast if this happens. And we'll tell you a little bit more about why, but these things are huge. They're, the plan is going to take um, 10 to 15 years of destruction of our oceans. Um, but, and part of what's not in this presentation that I really want to tell you about that's been happening this week, and I think you'll um, find it cause for concern is what's going on with our legislature. Ocean City, we have our own little government. We're an incorporated island with mayor and a city council. Orsted has been trying to, Orsted is the company that's making the wind farms and they've been trying to buy us out by offering different people in our community or our government high paying jobs. The latest offer was $50 million to build us a public safety center because they know that's that's something our mayor wants that's ridiculous but that tells you the kind of money that they stand to gain orsted is owned 51 percent by the danish government 49 percent by siemens international which is an incredibly corrupt german company these are not american companies coming to profit off our waters um they Real, they recognize that Ocean City in particular, but many of the Jersey Shore communities are pushing back. We don't want this. We feel like it's going to destroy our environment and our communities. So Orsted and the other company that wants to do this off Atlantic City, we're just south of Atlantic City. Um, there's another company that wants to do it a little further north. They pushed our legislators who our, our state is controlled by the Democrats and that's neither here nor there, but I'm just saying that's 
Our assembly and our Senate are both democratically controlled. And our governor is a Democrat. Two companies pushed our legislators, and there's no shame. I mean, they're telling it to the newspapers. They pushed our legislature to pass laws that now say that if any community doesn't want these gigantic turbines in their water or more importantly, they're huge cables that are devastating to come across our island and dig our island up that they can take, the state can come in and take it and give it to these companies. Um, essentially, they took our right to home rule away and our, our, our rights as American citizens and they basically gave it to Denmark. But, you know, that's something you can look at, but that's something we're very upset about right now because they're leaving us with no alternative. They're saying, if you don't like it, that's too bad. We want it. And we're going to just bulldoze part of your island to get it. Um, and I should mention too, that our electric is not, this electric that's generated will not be going to us in this county or any other nearby county. It'll all be going up north to New York area and Northern New Jersey, but they don't want the windmills up there. Okay. So this is what you'll see. Um, this is the Orsteds um, panel. This comes off their website, so it's basically a sales sheet, but I put in there what's in red. And basically, just so you're aware, the, the wind turbines shut off in high winds. Do not generate electricity in anything less than 15 mile an hour winds. So there's a very small window there and they can't store electricity if they're not spinning, unlike solar and other things. If it's not spinning, there's no electric being generated. So, you know, that kind of doesn't make sense already, but so there's that. And you guys have this PowerPoint. If at any point anybody wants to print this out and take a look at it, you can. Um, risk to mariners, uh, your Coast Guard down there is what's that base? I forgot. Well, no, one of the bases down there. Oh, they base. brought up to they brought up to the attention of the federal government that these things will interfere with the navigational equipment and could potentially interfere with rescues. Um, that's a problem. It interferes with any navigational equipment, whether it's Coast Guard, Navy, just your average fisherman. Uh, it's just not good. They don't always pick up on radar either, and, and they know that, and they're trying to figure out ways to, to help that. And you know, if you see the image on the screen there, imagine being out there in pitch black, and you just see that, and you're moving, and that's moving, and your boat's spinning. It's a, uh, it's it's very going to be very dangerous. So, now, the as they're doing this, they have to do blasting into the seafloor down 150 feet. Then they're gonna pile drive 36 inch diameter steel poles down into the seafloor. That's going to radiate up to seven and a half miles in any direction from that pole. That will kill, maim, or disorient most uh, marine mammals. But also it's gonna dig up the sediment and the um, the stuff on the bottom that a lot of fish use for their food supply. It's, you know, this is going to essentially destroy the current um, fish habitats that we have. And anything, any animal that uses echolocation is going to be very disoriented. It could actually, I don't know the right term, but essentially blow out the eardrums of the dolphins because of this. Um, I mean, if you're too close when it's going on, they'll, they'll go deaf and yes. you know, not be able to locate you know, themselves, food. They don't end mm -hmm. up dying. You know, in addition to the pile driving, um, you know, obviously they're going to have to lay you know, hundreds of miles of cable, hundreds. And that's jet plowed into the seafloor, which obviously digs up the live bottom that's down there and really you know, tears that up. So, I mean, not just the pile driving, but the cable laying is uh, another issue. And we, the Orsted is saying that these will actually increase fishing in the area, but we don't believe that's true uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's going to be too dangerous to go near there because you won't have equipment that works right. Uh, the cables emit electric impulses. 
So we're just not buying that. And there's no research that indicates that this is gonna be healthy for our environment. Um, this, it seems to me personally, is just a money-making opportunity for some people. But certainly it's not gonna be good for the communities involved. So, um, okay, now, leaking oil. And we're gonna, I'm gonna talk more specifically about this before I end my piece. But these things, in order to put these things up, these turbines, you have to first use fossil fuels to manufacture them, transport them, install them, monitor them, then repair them if they're broken, decommission them, remove them, and truck them out to a landfill in the Midwest somewhere. All using fossil fuels makes no sense to me. The fiberglass blades, they'll have fiberglass, they will have wires inside because they're gonna be wired so they don't freeze, they'll be little heaters. That's all gonna lay in a landfill for all eternity because fiberglass does not decompose. Anything that leaks from these things, and it's not just the turbines, there will be uh, three substations as well. Anything that leaks, where is that gonna go? It can only go into the ocean, it can't go anywhere else. So that's a problem. To interrupt okay. you, but something for you all to know to understand the magnitude, the size of these, the the monopole, which is the main pole that the blades, you know, sit atop, uh, you know, it's extremely, extremely heavy, and we keep hearing clean, green, you know, we all know how bad mining is for the earth, what that does to the earth. Uh, we know the countries that do some of this mining and not the safest conditions and deaths result from that, but one of those. Uh, monopoles is the equivalent weight of 13 of the largest 747 Boeing jets in the world. What? To give you an idea just how much material it takes to build a 36 foot wide by that thick, you know, uh, you know, monopole there. So it's a tremendous amount of resources that are being pulled, trucked, uh, you know, obviously ex explosions from, you know, when, when they're mining them. So there's a tremendous amount of fossil fuels being used on the back end for units that may last 15 years. I just wanted to add it in there to give you guys perspective on that. Yeah, and that's, you know, they're talking about when all is said and done, close to a thousand up here off New Jersey, but gov our government is talking about 10,000 on the East Coast. Imagine how much damage that could do to the environment. And before I go further into this slide, let me just tell you that the environmental studies have not been done. This is being fast tracked. Um, the people who are opposed to it are being ignored. The government is waiving certain um, requirements for studies, and particularly environmental impact studies. There's one issue that I have personally, and that's these cables emit EMFs, which is radiation. And they want to put this cable across my island, not too far from my house to go to an old abandoned uh, fossil fuel plant on the other side, on the mainland. So I, I have questioned that. And in the documents, it says the EPA statement is that, yes, we know that these cables will emit EMFs. And after they're laid, we, the EPA, will come in and measure that. And we will decide whether or not it's an acceptable level for human exposure. Well, are you kidding me? Uh, I should mention that Ocean City is, our motto is America's greatest family resort. We, this, everything we do here caters to small children and families. We can't even buy or drink or imbibe any kind of alcohol on our island because everything is related to the under 12 crowd. So that's just nuts that you know, the EP says, well, we'll just do it. The EPA says, we'll just do it and we'll, we'll let you know how dangerous it is after the fact. So, okay, back to the slide. If you look at the methods of disposal for this stuff, they're going to release the sewage and they'll cl they claim it's treated um, and the food waste, but yes. Uh, well, okay, sorry, this is for the construction. But it, my point is that they're going to release a lot of this purposely into the water and they're going to claim that it's been treated and that it's safe. But, you know, Virginia Beach, as well as any other American city, knows what happens when effluent gets into the water. 
and the beaches are closed and your tourism dollars are going right down the toilet. So, and this is something that they're planning to do in advance. They're telling us this. And that, to me, that's horrifying. Okay. Oops, wait a minute, sorry. This is during operation. This is just some of the stuff, most of which, by the way, is fossil fuel related, even though they're still swearing this is green and clean and will get us away from fossil fuels. Turns out you can't run these things without fossil fuels and, by the way, rare earth minerals, which isn't on this. Um, they are mining rare earth minerals such as neodymium out of China, and these poor people in China are, their cancer rates are like a thousand percent. These people are just dropping dead everywhere, and they're making a huge crater in the earth to mine this stuff, and it, there's going to be some of it in every single nacelle, in every single wind turbine in this country. So not only are we paying for something dangerous to be put in our ocean, but we're killing some Chinese people to do it, which to me seems wrong. Um, one of the things I want to point out is that sulfur hexafluoride, otherwise known as SF6, is 25,500 times more deadly than CO2. It is the singularly most dangerous deadly gas on the planet that we know of, at least according to my research. They're going to put a huge amount of that. What happens if that leaks? What happens if all this stuff leaks? And we know that they do. You know, the studies have shown that the on land wind turbines leak. So why would we think that the offshore ones are not going to? Yeah, those numbers there, I'm sure none of you could see it. On each substation, you're looking at roughly 133,000 gallons, you know, between transformer uh, oil, you know, lubricants. Um, uh, and whatnot. So you, between the three, you're looking at, of course, the 400,000 gallons of this stuff and at any given time to keep these things operational to fuel the boats coming back and forth. Um, so when you see something like that come out, it, it kind of makes you, again, question, well, how clean is this? You know, when, when does the clean start? Yeah. And that's another thing that Tony's bringing up that we don't have in the slides. And that is that these things will be lit 24 seven, every single one of them, but also they will be patrolled. There will be patro boat patrols, which of course all run, boats run on diesel fuel, which is, or marine diesel fuel, which is part of a fossil fuel. There will be boats in the water 24 seven monitoring these things and one to three helicopters daily monitoring these things. That makes no sense if you're trying to go green and clean, but okay, so that's that. Wind turbines, the ecosystem. Um, and I think Rick is this, or Tony is this you now? We're getting into the fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So next we're just going to hop into, you know, a couple slides, um, you know, discussing what's going to happen, you know, what some of the threats are to the ecosystem below the waterline. Obviously, you know, the birds above that. Um, you know, as Susan mentioned, my name is Tony Butch, uh, recreational fisherman. You know, it's kind of my hobby. Uh, you know, uh, I'm honestly in love with the ocean. My family is. I want to make sure that, you know, we have uh, the opportunity to fish for years and years to come. You know, both my kids are, you know, extremely uh, into it, avid fishermen. So, you know, it's very important to me. Th this slide here just kind of talks about the Atlantic flyway zone. You know, we had Orsett and, and even Bohm come out and show us, you know, different maps saying, oh, well, we're placing these in the right spot. There's nothing there. But if you hop on to oceandata.com and you look at all the heat maps and, and check out like, you know, the common loon, uh, you know, if you check out the northern gannet, you know, even uh, both, both seagulls, you know, both the, the predominant type of seagulls that we have here they all are all over this area. The heat maps are just crazy. And to hear them say that, you know, it's just gonna have no effect to that. And you know, you'll hear people push back and say, hey, well, you know that, uh, you know, cats kill more birds than wind turbines do. And when someone says that, you may kind of sit back and say, huh, the answer to that is very simple. Cats are killing robins. There's literally about a robin for every person in the United States. You know, the things that these are killing are like the osprey where there's like 16,000 mating pairs, that's it. These are the ones that get struck down that are falling to the ground. Eagles, you know, the turbines that are on land, obviously they're a big threat to them. Um, so this being in that flyway zone, hearing them tell us it'll be okay and it's safe, um, really does make, make you scratch your head. Slide to the next slide. 
So continuing with the marine mammals, this is obviously another heat map here. Um, Susan kind of touched on the whales, porpoises, seals, uh, basically the sensitivity that they have to the vibrations, to the noise. Um, this is something that, you know, is very concerning. As we mentioned, it's about a 15 mile radius that goes out from these turbine bases as they build them. Uh, you know, in building them, it's going to take, yeah, it's going to take years to put that many turbines in there. Uh, that is a big reason why you have a lot of these politicians backing it, a lot of the unions backing it, because this is jobs, jobs, jobs for the union counterparts that they work with. Um, but, you know, the whales, those are the ones that are going to suffer. The dolphins, they're going to suffer. Uh, black sea bass, studies have shown that the vibrations that these monopiles or even jacketed foundations give off creates an aversion to the fish there. Um, you know, we're continually told by these uh, wind companies that they'll make the fishing better, it'll give you a bottom structure. Um, but, you know, I think it's a little contrary to what they're saying there based on some other studies that have come out over in Europe. Next slide. So this hops into the right whale. Obviously, the right whale is one of the, the most concerning. Of course, we have humpback whales that, you know, we see very commonly in all of our waters here. Uh, the right whale, I don't know, is there a number? Yeah, 356 right whales left. Um, so they are an endangered species. Uh, they obviously live in our waters. They migrate in our waters. Uh, on here, it says mortalities of right whale outnumbering the births three to one. Uh, so this is a very concerning area for us. Uh, the way this has been addressed by these companies is that we'll have a lookout boat and when it gets too close, we'll stop. I don't know how many of you out there believe that. I don't believe that's going to happen. Uh, I, I believe if someone else is out there maybe looking to make sure that's happening, maybe it'll stop. Uh, but when do you spot it? When's it too close? Uh, like we said, these sounds can go out 15 miles. Uh, and, and to my understanding, they're going to be monitoring the immediate area of the construction there. Also, the right whale spends a lot of time in Virginia Beach. The next slide. All the way up and down the eastern seaboard, but it seems like they spend a lot of time between Virginia Beach and New York. So that's a huge concern for these guys. You go next slide. Okay, there you go. So cold pool breakdown. I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with uh, what the cold pool is, uh, how important the cold pool is. Um, so the easiest way to explain the cold pool is basically the difference in temperature as you go in the water column. And where we live at here in the Mid-Atlantic Bright, which is like from North Carolina, you know, into the New England area, it's one of the most unique areas in the world because basically it's in the summertime, it's one of the only areas you can catch a mahi on the surface and you can drop down and catch cod. You know, you can't do that in every area in the world. A lot of people say, well, they have these turbines over in the North Sea. It should be fine here. The North Sea is not the Mid-Atlantic Bright. It's completely different, complete, you know, complete different you know, structure, the makeup, temperatures. Uh, it's not the same. And, and there has not been enough studies done on this. The importance of that cold pool has a lot to do with shellfish. I'm not overly familiar with the shellfish uh, industry down in Virginia, but I know here in New Jersey that I believe our number one export here is scallops. That's a, a big, important industry here. Clams is a big, important industry here. And having that cold water at the bottom allows the scallops, the clams, um, other mollusks down there to be able to grow in the hotter months. When you put these foreign objects in there, we're not talking one or two, we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands, if you know our government here gets their way, that this is going to stir that up. Basically, you have these bases down there that are now an obstruction in the water that create turbulence in the water, that kind of flips that temperature and kind of mixes it around when it shouldn't be. That cold water should be staying at the bottom when mother nature says so. You know, these upwellings happen when you get into situations when there's storms, for example, they'll say, hey, the fishing was bad today, there was an upwelling. That happens naturally. This would just be a consistent everyday change there that's really gonna destroy the fishery. Uh, it's, it's gonna stop those scallops, clams from growing and it's gonna cause a lot of them to die as well when they have that unnatural temperature change there. Next slide. Suzanne's looking for the button. I'm trying to do it, but it won't advance. 13. Try the space bar. Uh, yeah, I'm hitting that, it's not working. Can we do it? Yep, working. I think my computer just froze. No, there we go. Right. 
Is that the next one? Oh, you have it. Okay. Yeah. So this just kind of lays out the mid-Atlantic bright where it falls to, you know, from between Cape Hatteras, North Carolina and Martha's Vineyard. I uh, pretty much covered this, but just the map kind of showing you where it's at. It talks a little bit more about, you know, what I had said there and the importance there. You want to go to the next one? I did. Oh, so, so now we're on EMF. So EMF, uh, that's electromagnetic field. So this is one of the major concerns that we have here. Um, you, know, you should have anywhere. So basically that is going to be given off by the cables. You're going to have the inner array cables that are connecting all the turbines. Then you're going to have export cables. Well, those are going to actually go to the substation. Then you have export cable going from the substation back to land. Uh, the way they're planning to do it is they want to run a made cable all the way along the coast. And if you ask any fishermen what this type of you know electromagnetic field does, it can deter fish, especially benthic species, which is bottom dwelling fish. The biggest one here would be fluke flounder. I'm not sure what you guys call it there, but that is our main staple fishery. Um, you know, especially when it comes to recreational anglers, it brings people to the shore. It's the warmest months from May to mid September, mid to late September. It's open. So you have a lot of tourism. You have a lot of people going to the ice cream shop, going to the deli, getting baked, getting ice, going to fish and whatnot. So they refer to the commonly as a flounder fence uh, that they don't want to cross that. And there has been studies there. I think this picture here might actually be from Dr. Gill's study from Cranford University over in the United Kingdom when he actually built a giant pen and pumped, you know, electromagnetic pulses in there with tag fish. And he showed the aversion to the, the magnetic field. Uh, he also did as part of that test, uh, the sound. Obviously, we talked earlier about the construction sounds and again, showed aversion to that. So there's not enough studying done on the cold pool, the long-term effects. There's not enough studying done on the EMF and to this magnitude, how it's going to affect us. Uh, what it seems like is they told us, oh, well, it'll be fine. It's not going to be uh, too bad. Uh, we haven't seen anything great, but if, if these go in and it, it does have the effects like Dr. Gill's study, I mean, it's going to be devastating to our, our fishing community. And that's all I have on, on my piece here. Um, obviously, we have happy to answer questions at the end. I'm going to pitch it over to Rick here now to talk a little about the extreme cost of these things. Okay, thank you. Okay, so you, as you know, you can imagine that the uh, the cost of offshore wind is great, much greater than onshore wind because of all the money they have to pour out to get these cable lines and everything going on. And in fact, it's about two and a half percent greater than they are for onshore wind. I, I saw a study recently that over the last ten years, the price is while the price is decreasing in the uh, for uh, the rate, it, solar is by far and by far a much cheaper solution. In fact, uh, and over the last 10 years, it's gotten as cheap as the or onshore wind is. So that's one thing to take in consideration. Uh, we also know that their power is not being generated at all times. And uh, since only when the wind turbines are spinning, so we have no guarantee of what's gonna happen with the uh, price. They would tell us $1.46 more a residential, uh, typical uh, residential bill, but uh, the formula for that just hasn't come up, come along when you calculate they have 20 year contracts and the 2% increases each year. So we just don't know what to expect from that. If you can go to the next slide, appreciate it. Okay, so as Susan might've mentioned that the uh, electricity is transmitted intermittently depending on the wind speed. They don't contain any, right now there's no batteries out there to store it at. So if we have no wind, we have no power, okay? The other thing to keep in mind is uh, the major transmission issues, okay? That's gonna be a huge cost. And the reason is on the next slide, I believe. Okay. And that happens to be where we see the, uh, in our case, the PJM, uh, connection for the power sources for the, all the surrounding states. The power from the electricity from the turbines will actually be coming from a easterly direction over to the west. That is not the way our lines are set up right now. So it's going to take a huge cost, as the BPU just mentioned yesterday, when they awarded an additional 200 wind turbines, both off of our coast and Long Beach Island, 
that it's going to be quite a handle at cost. They even one of the commissioners even admitted to the fact that uh, has no idea what it's going to cost. So they can't really come out and give you a guarantee. They won't even tell us what it's costing them to build these. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. Suzanne, since we're running be, uh, a little bit behind here, she mentioned some of the different types of uh, oils and so forth. So I won't go into the SF6 emission, but she did make a good point on it. And you have this slide, you can always look at it in more detail. So I'm gonna go down more to the money area, okay? And that happens to be, why are the wind turbine farms, I'm sure they're doing it down there, forming as limited liability companies. So I'm, I'm sure most of you know what that means, okay? So if we go to the next slide, please. So what you have in the case here is you have a holding company. That's what you and I might buy on the in our portfolio is a holding company and trade for that. And those holding companies actually have nothing value other than the companies they own that are producing income to them, which 94% of them are formed as limited liability companies. So if you're familiar with the limited liability company, you know that they have only have a limit to the amount of assets that they own. The holding company has no responsibility. The only loss that occurs to the holding company is the original or invested amount of money that they poured into it. So should that company run into any type of problems, the LLC, they can just claim, hey, we don't have the money for it. And I'll give you an example of that as we go along here. Next slide, please. Okay. So as I said, the limited liability company is the pass-through entity that they use. The, uh, and most companies are like this, 94% of the U.S. businesses. My personal one is formed as an LLC, okay? And I'm sure many of you have your own pro uh, businesses are formed that way too. It, it protects you, okay, from liability. It's your personal assets in the case of the holding companies, their assets. Next slide, please. Okay. So the major advantage of a holding company is the liabilities limited solely to the amount that the holding company is invested. It protects their assets and property. Any creditors of the subsidiary, in this case, the LLC gets sued, can't take anything from the holding company. It provides that legal protection or shield to them. Okay. So if we have a problem with outside, over and above, expected at the wind turbine farms, so or we prefer to call them turbines because that's what they really are, uh, not yeah. mills, uh, then uh, if they don't have the money to cover it, then you know who's gonna cover it. Right. Next, please. Okay, here's one in New Jersey. You all probably heard of PSC and G, but really it's Public Service Enterprise Group. You can buy it, it's PEG on the, on the uh, market. And they are the holding company of these that are listed below the subsidiaries. Uh, Public Service Electric and Gas Company, LLC. Public Service Electric and Gas Nuclear, LLC. And now their joint venture, Ocean Wind, LLC. So and there are the cases that they have. So if any one of these three have a problem, the holding company, PSE and G, or PSEG, the enterprise group, has no financial responsibility whatsoever. Next slide, please. And this is where this comes into play. In April 2019, uh, word that New Jersey's nuclear power plant operator would threat to close its nuclear plants, the state approved $300 million in subsidies through the residents' electric bills. It's not like the enterprise group didn't have the money to cover their losses. They didn't have to. And, and again, they did this in April just recently. Again, they came out, so we're going to close a nuclear power plant down at Salem. We're not making any money. We need money. Okay. And so what did the state do? They went to every electric customer in New Jersey. That's everyone, not those that are just PSA and G, and they've tacked on an expense for us. Okay. And I think I have a number down there, dollar forty-six is what we're, we're being told that the average residential bill go up. The fact is we don't know what it's going to go up until things go on. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. So that's because they're not public utilities. Okay. These are not public utilities where they can do such as things as come to our island and tear up the streets because that's what they need. Okay? 
They are private energy producers selling electric to the utilities and they sell them as credits. They'll sell them to a private company as credits. That's how they make their money. So the definition of public utility is there. Uh, but again, the wind farms are not public utilities. They're limited liability companies. And I think the next slide, please, which is upside on mine. Okay. So uh, this is the definition of what a public utility is and the critics that are on there, what Orsted has said about it. Uh, I would say that what you need to be concerned about is when we're talking here, the last slide, is the environment, the fishing industry, your rates, and the fact that we're talking here in New Jersey of hundreds and hundreds of 853 foot buildings, which by the way, would be the second highest building in the state of New Jersey. And off the island, Long Beach Island, there are nine miles is the lease area. I don't know what they are in Virginia Beach, but you can't say you're not gonna see them, okay? I, I, I'm finished with my presentation there. Go ahead, Suzanne. That's pretty much the end of things. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, I, I have some questions here from the audience. Uh, and the, the first two, uh, you kind of almost covered who actually profits in the end from the development of the wind, the wind farms. Over here in Virginia Beach, we have Dominion Power. And I recently went to one of their um, uh, public uh, input sessions. And uh, let me tell you, I asked a lot of questions, right? <laughs> They told me that our rates are going to go up 3% every year, that it's uh, going to cost anywhere from seven to $8 billion to build these. And of course, you know, they have, um, you know, shareholders. So a lot of people have stock in Dominion. A lot of uh, um, our public officials get uh, donations from them to make sure that uh, le legislation goes through beneficial to them as well. Okay, mm -hmm. do you have anything else to say about who, who is uh, going to um, profit from that other than what I just said? Well, I think you should look at um, not just Dominion, but who is actually the company that's going to put these up. I think your Dominion is like our PSE and G. And we're Orsted and Siemens are the ones that are actually doing it in their foreign companies. And I believe, and, and I'm not really sure, but I believe Orsted is working with Dominion to put these out there for you. Okay, well, Orsted put in our, uh, our test windmills, right? The yeah. two six mm -hmm. megawatt uh, a piece ones. Yeah. And according to Dominion, they said that we learned from them how to do this, right? So we are going to be in charge of, you know, what goes on from here, right? So, you know, somebody is going to be making the windmills and they said that was gonna be semen because they're the only ones that make the actual blades and uh, they have uh, factories overseas. Uh, in Germany. Yes, in Germany. No, no yeah, do your yeah. background on Siemens. They're a very corrupt company. You have General Electric who's making a lot of these too, the Howard X's. Yeah. yeah, and they tell us that um, uh, we don't have uh, anybody making them uh, windmills here in the United States. In fact, I think there was some place out in the Northwest or whatever that just closed down that was making them. So this was the only place that they could get them from, right? I think um, wasn't Dominion just approved today for an environmental impact study? I saw something today. About that. I, so, yeah, no, no, I didn't months. have time to, to look at that today. So the other thing they said was um, um, getting all this input from everybody. They're going to be sending out uh, contracts to do. Uh, all the stuff that needs to be done on there. And so what it boiled down to was that they're going to be the project managers. They are going to get the, the bids from these companies to do all the different parts and everything. And they're gonna make sure that everything is done 
according to specifications and everything, having learned how to put them in from Orsted. They're also building a $5 million ship, right? The ship that actually goes uh, out there with the parts and everything and goes up on these pylons. It's, it's really something to see in pictures, right? And then does all the work to install it. When you were talking about the uh, effect to um, wildlife out in the ocean, sea life and everything, I asked them that question about it disturbing them. They said, you know, if a whale was around, they'd have to wait for the whale to get away, you know, to move out of range and stuff like that. And they couldn't like, um, like schools of fish and say, follow the fish or it's so you get out of the way. They just have to naturally wait for them to go away before they would continue. They also said they were going to put a high, uh, a bubble, like an air bubble thing in there oh, that would oh, somehow minimize the sound. Yeah, bubble curtain. And that, that has not been proven. Yes, a hydraulic ram is a uh, what is going to be uh, doing the drilling, mm -hmm. and then they were going to have that bubble to minimize the sound for the fish. Okay. So Just who's paying for the construction the for maintaining the windmills? Us, the taxpayers. Well, yeah. Well, I think the ship's being built at uh, because of the Jones Act, and they're yeah. going to that Orsted use it everywhere, not just off Virginia. Oh, yes, yeah. so they want to turn this into a whole American industry so that they would be doing this all over the country. Well, I'm right just now, waiting for them to, to, to go around that law, and I'm waiting for them to say, oh, well, you know, we need to get these things built faster, and we need to circumvent that. We built one in the United States, and we're going to just bring some from over here because you already have them, and it will make an exception just to, to help us meet our needs. So I would yeah. not be surprised if that's something that happens. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say this, that I don't know how it is down in Virginia. <laughs> but I do know in New Jersey that uh, we're fighting a battle that is not going to be won at the election poll, it seems, unless something dramatic happens. So uh, our method to get these stopped are going to be perhaps a different way uh, and a number of uh, joining in a, an, an alliance with other communities that have uh, groups that are against the turbines throughout the East Coast. Because in numbers, we will be able to uh, cause some delay in what's occurring. But if you do have a, a, a state, a legislature that does listen to you, that doesn't have an agenda uh, uh, in their back pocket, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> there you go. So, yeah, it's unfortunate that it, to try to fight these on your own, that's a big battle. You know, uh, the best way to get these accomplished is going to have to be everyone joining in together. Okay, this says here, um, who owns the windmills? Now, I, I kind of asked that kind of question. I said, they're having a 33-year lease, right? So I said, so after 33 years, after we spend $8 billion to build this whole thing and everything, are you guaranteed to be able to renew that lease after taxpayers paid for this? And he goes, you know what? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> Our understanding is that they will have to have money put to the side for decommissioning, but no one has an idea what that actual cost of decommission is since it's 25 years or so down the line. But So if you're running the same way as Jersey, is that what they're doing, they're bidding on these contracts. And uh, whoever gets the lower bid uh, is considered, for example, in New England, 70% of the award was based on the price that the company offered. So, you know, you they lowball, so that's what they're going to get from the state for the production. In New Jersey, it used to be 70. They brought it down to 50%. So 50% is on the price. The other 50% is, you can imagine, okay, <laughs> where it might come from, whether it's experience or who you know, what you have favors that you may have. So uh, after those 20 years are up if they're not profitable here in new jersey being llc's they'll probably just walk away and uh leave it sitting there and mm -hmm. then we'll be dealing with that hmm. um question aren't the dutch taking down many of their offshore wind farms is it because they're old or is there another reason 
I don't know the answer to that. I mean, their life I cycles are starting to come up. Their life cycles starting to come up overseas, and there's a lot of uh, problems in Europe right now because they're having a lot come up at the same time. And you know, taking them down, the cost, then figuring out what they're going to do with them, who's going to take them. You know, obviously the ones we're going to have here, they can be the biggest in the world. You know, each blade is is longer than a football field from back of the end zone to back, and even further. Uh, so they're, they're they're kind of running to that that issue right now. Um, so. That's, that's the main reason why they're taking them down. I do know that, you know, some of the things going on in Germany, Germany's kind of pulled back in their push towards, you know, the wind energy because they're still not catching up. You know, uh, if you really look into it, like, you know, Germany versus France, you know, France is primarily powered by nuclear. Uh, their costs are much lower. Their emissions are actually much lower, uh, you know, based on how they're doing it. But unfortunately, uh, some people hear the word nuclear and they get, you know, scared of it. But, um, you know, that's the way France is going and they're, they're really outpacing Germany. It's kind of interesting if you dig into those two and see what they're doing. Okay. Yeah. Well, I asked how big ours are, are and they said 800 feet tall. And I said, that's above and below the water. And they said, no, that's above the water. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was like, okay, how long, how long do these things last before you have to, um, replace them or whatever. And he said, well, it's like anything. They have a minimum of 25 years. If we take care of them and maintain them, they may last longer. And I said, and, and then what do, will you do with them? Because they're not recyclable. And he goes, well, we're going to try and see if they can develop something that's recyclable in part, but you're right, they're not. So, and they don't have any that have ever lasted 25 years ever. So that's a new trick. It's funny you were told that we, we were, we've been told, you know, 15 minimum, and 20, 25. And, you know, they say they, they can recycle, changes. they can recycle the monopile, but not the blades. And it's interesting. You kind of got that answer, you know, from a different company, you know, what we got, you know, from someone else she said kind of the same thing. It was like, well, 25 years from now, who knows what technology would be around maybe we could recycle the blades then. And we were kind of like, did she really just say that? But initially two years ago, or the company reps from Orsted looked me in the face and said 10 to 15 year life expectancy for these things. It's now gone up to 25. Interesting because the blade or the thing hasn't changed. They don't really know because this particular type of wind turbine has never been made before. It's bigger than what you have down there by a lot. And it's, you know, not only are these the biggest ones ever made, they're also putting them in more numerous in the same location than has ever been done anywhere in the world. Right. So yeah, they I, don't really know. I they believe, can guess. Yeah. I believe in Virginia Beach, are they going out 23 miles? Is that right? Yeah. 27. 27. 27, 27 so. miles off the coast. Right, which is nice for the view, but on the other hand, they're going out into deep water and there hasn't been any experience of having these sizes out there. In the seabeds that we have, they're a lot different than the North Atlantic. Add on to that, they, I think they're good up to a cat three, they guarantee on a hurricane. So there's a lot of risk there that we don't have an answer for. Instead of putting 10 out off your coast, they choose to put out hundreds because the money is made in the multitude or the number of that they can get out there because they get those credits and everything going so instead of uh taking this sea coast and saying let's see how this does about the fishing industry or let's see how that does with the with your right whale or anything like that they just choose to put them out there and then use studies that have not been completed in fact and one of the slides that tony had there he didn't actually mention but bone was sent a letter by the noaa about they're, uh, the developer is not going through the proper baseline studies. Uh, that was on March 29th of this year. Mm. So you can see how they're fast tracking it. And something to keep in mind, and we see this all the time. I know Rick has you know, referenced plenty of these articles within our group, just how fast technology moves and, and new technologies that are already coming out like super solar or you know, other wind uh, capturing energy generating uh, devices that are just outpacing this. And as you can see, they put five test turbines, as they call it, in Block Island, which are much smaller than what we have, a different brand that we have. And that was just a handful of years ago. And they are already obsolete. Those are not going in our waters. These new ones that are taller, create more megawatts are going in. 
once they put in those hundreds, they will be outpaced. It's like uh, anyone, I'm sure we all have cell phones here. You buy a cell phone today, two, three years from now, your phone is slow, doesn't work. Camera's not as good as the new ones. Like you need a new one because it's just not keeping up to what technology is doing. And these are no different, except they just cost billions and billions of dollars. And once they're in, they're in. And they told us that if they're in the middle of doing the project, say they're doing 200, they put 100 in, maybe 50 are installed, they're doing, approaching 100, and a new technology comes out. There's no change in that. They can't say, hey, this is better, mm-hmm. this is this is smaller, but it's creating more energy. Like, that's it. They committed to the manufacturer, the process. They have to put them in at that point. That's that. And, and so that just shows you they don't care. It has nothing to do with... Uh, you know, what's better? It's, hey, this is what we're committed to. We're making money. We got the contract. Things are going. That's it. And I mean, the numbers don't lie. There's a lot of people here that are due to make money. And it's, it's none of us sitting here, unless one of you guys happen to work for, you know, one of these large wind energy companies or the state. Um, so it's really disheartening to see what's going on. Well, uh, when I was at uh, this uh, public um, input thing, I talked to three different people there. I talked to the project manager, I forget what the other guy's job was and and the electrical engineer, right? And one of the questions I asked was this uh, two questions that they had here uh, about windmills and standing up to hurricanes and what happens, right? So two things, they said that they turn the windmills so that the windmills aren't spinning during a hurricane so that that won't do anything to them. And they said that um, the, the, and I asked, well, and if you're doing that hydraulically, then there's oil and stuff and everything in there. And he said, no, it's um, electric, it's uh, electric mechanical or uh, with magnets, right? I forget what he actually said. And he drew me a map and he said there was magnets all around it and there was electromagnetic current that actually was gonna turn this thing. And there was no um, no fossil fuels involved in moving the windmills or anything like that. And I also asked about the picture you had on your website, you know, because the two people that jumped off and everything. And they said every safety precaution is, uh, is, is being taken, you know, there's uh, ladders along the side or inside or something like that. Or, you know, so that somebody would be able to get down and not have to jump off the top of one of these things and to their death, right? Just, Diana, just so you know, the great the um, the grids on the slides that we had that was that show you all the oils and lubricants that came from uh, the Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, and it was submitted by Orsted and the manufacturers of these things. We didn't just, you know, make that up. It's no. they're telling us it's in the the cop, which I forget what that stands for, but do you know? Yeah. You said it may be an older um when no, like these the are new specific ones new, uh, electronic you know no, this matter. was this those charts that we gave you are specific to the Halliday um turbines and that's what was submitted to our government federally and state wise so that's what is being okay to be put in there so they're not uh, you know i can't speak for old dominion but i can tell you as far as orsted and they are the leading manufacturer of these things right now that's coming from them they that was their submission to the federal government and to the epa and to boem and the other thing they said was they were doing environmental studies and, and they have to go through all of this stuff before they actually, you know, get started um, doing the actual uh, installation, which is supposed to be done by 2026 or started by 2026. Now I can't remember. Right. Yeah, a lot of that was waived by the federal government. Uh, specifically but in new jersey a lot of the environmental impact studies were waived well they're well technically they they have to do them they're doing them now you know once Mm -hmm. that uh 
once the notice of intent was released, that's when it could start. And, you know, we were in communication with them to say, when's it going to be released? And their answer is kind of your guess is as good as mine. And obviously we know when, you know, uh, our current president came out and I think it was early March and said, Hey, we're going to make a push for this. We're going to, you know, we need to pull out some stops. It's being, you know, it's just taking too long. Literally when he did that for the wind push, I think it was two or three days later, boom, like the NOI was released and the, and the time started ticking and they have like 25 months to do the environmental impact study. So call it a coincidence, call it what you will. I mean, it happened to happen there. And, and clearly a week prior to that, Worcester had no clue when that was going to happen. So clearly the, the, the hoops to, to jump through are being removed. Uh, so they're currently doing that now, but the part that makes you skeptical, at least here in our state, is that, you know, our, our government here, our state government, you know, they've committed uh, well over a quarter of a billion dollars to a facility we have here in Paulsboro, New Jersey, which is on, you know, the so southern west side of the Delaware River uh, manufacturing area. Not much going on there now. It's trying to revitalize that there. So they're trying to retrofit a port there and reinforce, you know, the port with, you know, I told you how heavy the poles are to be the monopile hub there. And so he dumped a quarter of a billion dollars into that. So when you're sitting here as a resident, you're like, well, that's a quarter billion dollars of our tax dollars, but the environmental impact study hasn't been done yet. So you're literally putting the carriage before the horse. You know, it could come back and say, hey, this is a terrible idea. It's going to tear up the fishery. We can't do these. And I mean, as our governor to say, well, sorry, gave away a quarter of a billion dollars, like we're okay. It almost makes you feel like it doesn't matter what the impact study comes back to say that, you know, it's going through. Hmm. Um, the other question I asked was, uh, and, and somebody asked it, um, what about the, um, we have a lot of military ships here. What about the, you, yours is concerned with fishing lanes, but we have a lot of ships, Navy ships and, and air transit you know, and so they said they were working with the military and everything, and that um, the federal government gave certain areas where that they can do these windmills, right? There are only certain areas they can't go anywhere else. They didn't pick the areas the federal government did, and they are outside of the um, travel lanes of our ships. So our ships supposedly go this way, while these ours is 180 windmills they're sticking up. Right, you you have a lot more, right? But the only concern is, so far they said the Navy had was, what if a man goes overboard and now we have to go out of our standard shipping lanes to to get them? So they said they're working with all of these groups to uh, uh, mitigate these problems. But yeah, that was one of their concerns. So, did you have any of that? We do, but there for us, these are going to be much closer to the shore. Our, they will be on the east side of the shipping lanes, but that's part of the problem is that our federal government has arbitrarily decided where these things are going to go up and down the east coast. For example, in New York, they won't be where the Navy ships have to go um, up there and down your way, they're going to be out of the shipping lanes. But basically, they're just saying the hell with everybody else. Here's a little community that are, are, we're the very southernmost county in New Jersey. So if that, if you can picture that, we're the bottom of the tip. Yet our real estate values are high. It's it's very similar to living on the beach in Virginia Beach. We contribute a significant amount of tax dollars to the running of our state. I forget how much it is, but it's, I think 44% of our annual budget comes from the money they get from here, but they don't even care. They're just anywhere. And I can tell you that when they put five to 600 of these things in an area that's 10 times the size of our little island and they're lit up day and night and they're running wires across our island and digging up our streets, that's going to destroy our tourism, which is the only thing. We have some of the most amazing schools. We, our school, our high school, we only have one high school, and it partners with, um, I think, Oceana Base, and also it partners with NASA. We send stuff up in rockets. We have just an amazing school system. We have a beautiful, safe place to live, and that will be destroyed, and... The government doesn't care. They're not even, they took away our right to decide for ourselves and our community 
what is okay to put across our land and what's not. For example, we spent our little teeny island, we spent over $50 million on flooding mitigation and remediation. Yet, and we really don't want this stuff coming across, but um, in doing this, first said it's gonna dig up a lot of that work that we just paid that money for and they're gonna put it back, whatever. However, they're gonna do it, but you know, it's just, it's wasteful and it's not okay. And, and for me, one of the biggest things other than the environmental is that our federal and state government are taking away our rights. Well, thank you so much for coming. And for everybody here, I put these on your table. Those are from um, Dominion when I went to the public uh, thing, just to let you know that the Virginia Beach cables landed in Camp Pendleton, right? Camp, from Camp Pendleton, they're going to a switching station over on Harper's Road, right? If anybody knows where Harper's Road is, you remember the data center? It's between the data center and uh, the back of those neighborhoods. Right from there, those transmission lines to get them on our electric grid have to go all the way down to Fentress. Some of those cables are going to be run underground. Some of those cables are going to be run overground. Some of them may be going past your neighborhoods. They have several different uh, projected, uh, you know, sites where they're going to go. Right. And they want everybody to go on their website, right? It's back here on the back page. You can put in your address and see whether any of those transmission lines, any of their projected routes are going to be near, close, or through your neighborhood. And there's a phone number there too, and uh, you can ask questions and give your input, et cetera, okay? And with that, we will um, now go to Laura Hughes and happy birthday to Mike. Everybody, I want you to sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mike. Happy birthday to you. His card. Everybody signed the card for you too. Thank you. Can <laughs> we come up here and say a few words, Mike? In Farsi. Yeah. All right. I want to thank you, all of you. They did this surprise me. I didn't know. She came there, pick up the cake. I was helping her. She <laughs> didn't miss up the pie. <laughs> anyway, I. Thanks all of you, okay? Thank you for coming in all these days, all this past past year from when we started this doing these things in here. Because of you guys, we stay open here and thank you for your help. Thank you for supporting the business and thank you and enjoy your freedom holiday. This is coming up, freedom holiday. We, I, I hope you all of you enjoyed it and be good for everybody. And for for the country, for the uh, everyone, believe in it. Anyway, thank you very much. How uh, old? Uh, 78, 78, 78. 78. 78 now. Thank you. Thank you. I know that. 78. Thank you. Appreciate it again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, while she's slicing the cake and stuff, we'll go ahead with the business meeting.